uh, let's start. Uh, welcome to this session about CQRS and event sourcing and the relation between this two weird world and how we manage data. In this presentation, we are going to do some time travel, so be careful. Young developer may not be completely understanding everything we will speak about when we will speak about entity beams. Uh, so my name is Clément Escoffier. I should have presented this talk with Edson Yanaga. Uh, unfortunately, Edson had some personal issue and was unable to come here, so I'm, I'm going to do the talk by myself. Um, and le well, let's start. The first thing is when we start discussing doing this talk, Edson was writing this mini book here that you can download for free to this URL. So migrating to microservice databases. And on my side, I was uh, trying to write this book here and about reactive microservices. And when we met, we said, yeah, actually, it's very close. So we can try to, to see how the both fit all together. And we did this presentation, because writing another book is way too much work. So we say, let's do slides. So the first thing that we need to understand is that code is easy. But the state is very hard. Will you, maybe not you, but you probably uh, handle data that has been written 30 years ago in a very weird database, and it's still there. Do you believe that the code you have developed today, or you are going to develop tomorrow or Monday, will stay alive for 30 years? I can guarantee you that it won't be the case. It's going to be replaced. So data is there forever. While the code, we don't care. Everybody is talking, yeah, don't worry, we can scale, it's going to be stateless. Yeah, do you know any stateless system where there is absolutely no state? Even games have a state. So there is state everywhere, and you have to handle it. And it's a hard part. So let's now start a time travel. And remember how we were handling data 10 years ago. This is 10 years ago, so it's mostly 2008. So yeah, it's uh, a little bit more than this now, 12. We were all terrified by entity beans. Who were not terrified by entity beans? <laughs> Every time you wanted to do this, oh, man. Fortunately, a few years later, we had things like Hibernate that came into play and just replaced XML with annotations. So cool. We have annotations now. And you start creating beans and with IDs and stuff like that, and you end up with portals. But what kind of portals? Anemic portals. There was just getter and setter. There is no logic inside those portals. There is no behavior. It's just your structure. And here is the thing. We were working on data just by thinking about the structures and not the behavior. And we are going to see this difference a lot of time during this presentation. Event sourcing was coined a little bit at the same time, 2006, 2008, but never really took off, right? We were all about GPA, ORM, GDO. Yeah, we also had GDO. Nobody remember it, but it was nice. <laughs> uh, so, but event sourcing was there. The issue is that the difference between the technology we had at that time and event sourcing were so big, the gap was so big that nobody was able to really use event sourcing. Fortunately, 10 years later, it's time to catch up and see what we can do now. So what is event sourcing? Well, let's imagine a very, very simple example where you have accounts, an account table where you have the ID, users, and the money you still have left on your bank account. This is more or less a view of all the bank accounts, fine. However, how do we compute this value here? This value comes from transactions, right? So we also have a transaction table. We have a transaction table where we have credit and deposit, and for each, uh, each has a timestamp, so that's my operation, and every time we say how much we take from the bank account, how much we put on the bank account. So when we write a transaction, we also update the balance. Right? So we are updating two tables. There is another way to think about it. 
This will say, hey, let's keep this transaction and represent them as events, because that's what we want. So we have all my transactions are events, so it starts with this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And if I want to know how much money I still have on my bank account, that's pretty simple. I restart from the beginning of the times and I replay all transactions related to my account until I reach the final transaction and I get my final state. So that works well if you have if the end of time was yesterday. But if the end of time was really 30 years ago, it can take time to compute your latest uh, value on your bank account. And you don't probably don't want to wait in front of the ATM 15 minutes because it just collects that. However, this has a very great uh, um, benefit. Very, very fast to write. Because to write this, you just need a log and an app and only file system where you just write on the last one. And when you need to replay, you will take the files from the first entries and <laughs> reiterate over it. So fast write, but the querying can be a little bit more complicated. OK, let's now introduce something a little bit different. Um, CQS, be careful, it's not CQRS, it's CQS, Command Query Separation. And it can be summarized by uh, this, uh, this quote from Bertrand Meyer, that he, I think he quoted when he was working on AFER, asking a question should not change the answer. And the idea behind that is just abstraction. Instead of having one interface that has write and read operations inside the same interface, let's have two. That sounds reasonable, right? We can all do that. The thing is, and the uh, mayor's quote is about that, a query operation should not change your data. Never. That means that if you emit several times the same query, you should always have the same answer, if obviously you don't have a write in the middle. So, okay, this looks simple. That's CQS, okay, we have a write interface, a read interface. We are good with that, right? That's simple. Now let's see CQRS. CQRS extends CQS with a couple of other things. And one of the things is the, uh, the common query separation. We still have two interfaces. They are a little bit more structured. One is do validation, commands, domain logic, and write. And the other one is doing queries. What is important at that level is two things. The write data store and the read data store may not be the same. It might be two different technologies, or it might be two different tables, or whatever, but it's not the same. Second thing is generated DTO, data transfer objects. Um, imagine that, let, let's take an example uh, using GPA. Everybody knows GPA a little bit. You have an account person, or well, a person class. A person has a name, last name, and a set of addresses, because obviously we're rich, we have many houses and stuff like that. Um, but, so when I write that, I create my new person and I persist it using GPA. However, I want to display a person on my mobile phone, and in that case, I don't want all the information. For example, I don't care about the address, I just need the first name, last name. What we do with generated query, uh, DTOs is that it's going to create a view automatically for every write with exactly what you need inside your UI or inside your business logic. So there is a complete separation between what you write and the entities you write and what you read. And think about it. It's always more working like that. You don't need all the data. When, when you create users on, on any website and when you query it, it's two different views. It's not the same set of fields. That's exactly it. But how, how does that work? Well, to work, we have to merge CQRS and event sourcing all together. Remember the example? We have our uh, uh, account, which is my read model, where I have the latest balance of my bank account, and I have the... Um, 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 transaction table, where it's my write model. So it's already not bad because I really have two models. The one that I queried from my mobile phone is the read one, and the one that I uh, write when I do uh, uh, on the ATM or when I paid is this one. So it's fine, it's 
obey a little bit to, to, the, to these patterns, but all one flow to the other one. And it's where the notion of events happen. Actually, so when you, when you are going to write into the transaction table, it's going to emit an event. And this event will be read by the other data store, and it's going to update its view. So for example, if we take the first line, when I do a credit of 1,000, it's going to update the first line over there. So that means that it was at zero before, right? Yeah, probably this. So in practice, how does that work? Well, you need an event bus. So I use event bus as a very generic term here. It can be message worker, it can be whatever you want. Just something where you have events flowing. So we have our commands writing inside my write star over there. It's emitting an event. That's flow inside my event bus. And then I have my read data store that get it, update the view. Update the view? Well, that's the whole time. No, it's all about notifications. You go on a website, how many times you have a small pop-up that say, hey, do you want me to help you or whatever? Oh, six people are looking at the same hotel. Hurry. Such kind of thing. So we are really in a push world. And to do that, it's the same thing. As soon as we have a write, go through the event bus, and then it can push to the view directly using WebSockets or SAC or whatever kind of technology you can imagine or text message as we are going to see later. So the fact that with this technology we can listen and push is actually a big, big move and it will create a knowing UI from my point of view, but it's what people want today. So why CQRS? Well, the first reason at the beginning, we already said it, it's performances. Fast write. You write very, very quickly on your write data store and well, let's see, uh, for, for, uh, for the read view, you can compute them, cache them, so it can be fast too. But there is other reason, especially in the microservice world. First is distribution. The write and the read are two different data store. So you can have one write and a few reads, a few read data stores somewhere that are closer to the user. So imagine that we have, uh, again, our uh, um, um, system where we write at some point, and then those writes are flowing using events to some different data stores. One is using, let's say, an in-memory data grid like Hazelcast or InfiniSpan. The other one may use the most traditional uh, database, Oracle or MySQL or whatever. And it's fine to do that. So we really have a distribution. It also, because we have this, fix the problem of availability. When you have one database, what happens when the database crash? You have nothing. Here, because we have a segregation between the write store and the read store, well, even if the write store crashes, don't care. You still have the read store. So the users can still do some operation. OK, they won't be able to write, but at least they can have something. Um, it's also about integration, because we can integrate many, many technologies, and technologies that you can't very weird in terms of data. And obviously, because we have these events, we can do analytics, because we can just observe those events and say, hey, that's how many transactions you made in the last 10 minutes on this bank account. Mm, might be some fraud going on, or something like that. It, ha it actually happened to me last week where my bank was, I was in Singapore, and my bank was thinking that my credit card was stolen. Stupid machine learning. Uh, no, I traveled there. Anyway, so how does that work? We have a write uh, a data store, which is my canonical source of information. It's where I write. And this, every single write, can, will, will generate events that can be consumed by one or more read data store. Here I have two of them. One can be used for doing graph, for example, and one can be used for uh, uh, sending text message or something like that. This part here is actually where the magic may happen in terms of, of reactive. Because uh, we have a flow of events. But as soon as you have a flow of events, you need to ask you a couple of questions. First, how long is acceptable before between a write and the view to be updated? Is 
30 milliseconds is one minute. How long does it take for you when you get cash from the ATM until your balance is updated on your website? Well, believe me, it's not, yeah, the notion of transaction, <laughs> come on. <laughs> no, that would be too slow. So the latency is the first question you will, you will need to, to think about. Size, how much data are you going to send? Is, is that big? Is that small? If it's big, maybe you don't want to flow it inside events. Maybe you just want to send this diff. So you need to think about that. That can be very, very heavy, especially on the cloud where you pay for the bandwidth. As soon as you leave the region or when you do from one cloud to one cloud provider to another cloud provider. Stainless. Um, how long does the data you have on the read data store is valid if you didn't get any update? That's also something. Is balance always valid or is something that you need to refresh regularly? Uh, well, ownership, it's all about security. Who owns the data? Especially in a microservice world, it's a good question to ask. Who owns the data? Is that the guys that do the write or is that the guys that do the read? Who is responsible? Well, who is to blame when the data gets corrupted? That's more of the question that you need to ask. Um, security, of course. Uh, yeah, so Hudson <laughs> wrote these this slides and sent that to me and said, types with a question mark. I said, yeah, thank you. So um, <laughs> this, I, I don't like the term types, but basically what, what Hudson mean by this is, um, do you need to keep all the data or do you want to just have the latest one or the few latest one? That's a good question too, because if you have a read store, why you want to keep everything that can be very, very big? Maybe you don't need everything. Maybe you just need the 10 last. Maybe you just need the last, then it's a cache, but still works. Depending on your answer to this question, you may use very, very different technologies. First one that I will cite is InfiniSpam, it's an in-memory data grid. You could use also Hazelcast or Coherence. They're all great, they mostly <laughs> have the same set of features. They are it's very competing world, so. Uh, so the idea here is that the, your data is going to be shared automatically and scaled automatically, and you can do continuous query where you will, you will be updated or notified as soon as the data changes. So it's very nice for those read data store. ActiveMQ, while well, MQP 1.0 uh, implementation, so here we are speaking about durable, persistent messaging uh, with the latest broker, it can even be uh, um, internet scale, so we have Kafka. Who is using Kafka today? Ah, even here. So Kafka is something that is just invading the whole world. It's not necessarily a good news, because sometimes it should not use, well, people should not use Kafka for what it's not. Kafka is not a database. Um, but Kafka is great if you want to do event sourcing because it's going to persist your record. And it can persist your record forever, well, until you run out of disk space. Then it's forever is limited. Well, in computer, forever is limited. Um, but it's very great for this because you, can, you have this replayability and it works very, very well. However, if you want to do a published subscribe with one million customer, consumer, don't use Kafka. That doesn't scale that way. Um, I will finish by Vertex, obviously my favorite one. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Vertex is a reactive toolkit to build distributed and reactive applications. But let's see how reactive fits in this view. So for this, we need to join reactive and event sourcing. And I said that this part, the yellow part, was where the magic happens, because you need to transfer those data from one point to another point. And we have seen a set of technology for this. Obviously, you have the same event bus here between your mobile phone, for example, and this data, uh, read data store. So where reactive come into play here? Well, my events from a sequence of data, right? It's ordered sequence of data. An ordered sequence of data is a data stream. And reactive is all about data stream. It's going using either reactive streams or reactive programming, give you a very nice API to build and to a compose event-driven and asynchronous software that are made to handle data stream and unbounded data stream because, oops, nothing says that this is going to finish at some point. 
can be unbounded data stream. There is a lot of things you can't do on an unbounded data stream, like don't try to concatenate. We have concatenate, we'll wait for the termination of the first one, and it will never happen. Um, looks silly, but I got the case from a customer trying to concatenate an infinite st data stream. Doesn't work. Um, so reactive works very well here, and it's where we can see how reactive programming and reactive streams can really help you build event sourcing and uh, secure uh, uh, system. So how it works, well, you have an API like that. So this is using Eric Java 2. Uh, so we have the stream, so it's my flow of data, then I transform the data, then I do a flat map completable, which is a composition of another asynchronous section. And the last line is very important because if you forget to subscribe, nothing is going to happen. It's a particularity of data streams. They are lazy. So let's see a little bit how it works in reality. I've developed, hopefully it's going to work. Um, I, I had a few issues a few minutes ago, so let's see. Um, I have an application which is uh, doing random health-based data that will write in a data store. This data store, I picked MySQL because well, MySQL is still cool. I have something called Debezium that will read the log written by MySQL and will send that to Kafka because I really want to have all my write to my database from all my tables in an order fashion and don't miss anything. So Kafka is what I need here. Then I have two read data store. One, uh, both are um, uh, both are actually microservices, but they can be used as, as data store. Um, and one is going to send that the data to MQ, ActiveMQ. And I have an application using Vertex that will just display a nice chart. I have another one here that will resend the data to Kafka. And I will do some analysis of the data and detect alerts. So for example, if my body temperature reaches an unnormal level of my blood pressure, then it will send uh, a text message to this phone here, if I have network. And I do have network. So let's see. Uh, if you are interested by this demo, this repository here. So I've deployed this demo on, uh, on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, let's start the data generator. So there is quite some component in building such kind of demo, as you can see. Um, so we have Zookeeper on Kafka. Don't use this in production, because you can see that I'm using one part of it, so it's not a cluster. The topic controller is, con is configuring all the topic from Kafka. Um, the web app is a web app, OK? What do I have? Uh, MySQL. My data generator is writing data. The dispatcher is doing the uh, two, uh, uh, two read, uh, the read store. MQP and my alerting. Hey, it seems to work, because I got a text message. And here is my dashboard. So Edson, that is not there, and me. Um, I'm generally, um, the first microservice is randomly generating some data, writing to a database. This goes to, uh, to Debezium, so to Kafka. I have some analysis, then go to ActiveMQ, then go to Vertex again, EventBus, WebSockets, and there it is. It's flowing directly in my browser. So every write is going there. Uh, every write, no. No, 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 no. That won't work. Why? Because this is Google Chrome, and it doesn't really scale. So I had to remove a few events and keep only the last 10 when I start, because I don't care about the full history. There is Kafka in the middle, so if I will restart, it will restart everything. So no, I just keep the, la the last 10, and I remove uh, some events. Uh, I think I keep two per second, something like that. So it's really interesting, but Chrome is limited to five events on uh, the WebSocket by second. It's not much, but yeah. OK, and on the other part, I have the alerting things. And uh, what's your name? York. York. So York, I will tell you. Can you read one, York? You can read? I can read. OK, yeah. cool. No, it should be fine. Can you read the latest text message? Patient Edson, temperature reached an abnormal level 38 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Edson is sick. See, he's not here. 
definitely not. So here, I'm receiving for every alert um, a text message. So it is going to cost me a lot of money, man. OK. Um, the idea here is that when we do alerting, I didn't use ActiveMQ. I use a second Kafka topic. And the reason is, is because as I do alerting, I want to be able to go back in time and check when the broken behavior appeared for the first time. So here I need a complete history. So I'm using Kafka as a really long log since the beginning of ages. And I will be able to replay per patient all my records, all the values I have uh, collected. Okay, that's more or less all I have. Yep. So if you have questions or if you want to contact us, you can write to this two email address here or follow us on Twitter. And don't forget about the books. I should have yeah, the books here. There it is. So if you want to go both on the reactive side or on uh, uh, data management side, I re highly recommend these two uh, free ebooks. So you can download them from free. And well, then you need to read them. Um, that's better. And sometimes we have hard, co hard copy, but not at this conference. I don't know why, but well, I'm not marketing. So, But um, anyway, with the online version, you can search in PDF. So it's much better. Thank you.